orthopedic surgeons actually hate a lot of theoretical stuff and bearing surfaces is actually something which you choose based on your theoretical knowledge and let's see how much we can make it more lucid and interesting to the orthopedic surgeons today and as highlighted a lot of times in the previous talks thr is the uh, thr is the operation of the century Learman said it in Lancet in 2007, and everyone has been repeating it since for the last dozen years. It is not just one of the most successful surgeries; it is also one of the most constantly evolving in terms of technological innovations. But with all that innovation, is the survivorship of THR really what it is supposed to be? Really, what we can we want it to be? Well, 25 year old old pool survival data of hip replacement from K series. and joint replacement registries was published in lancet last year and it was something which i got surprised with only 77% survival in k series which is mostly from the designer uh, just thing like uh, designer centers like exeter writington and from joint replacement registries we had only a survivorship of 57.9% that was a major surprise i thought the survivorship would be better but then that's why uh made me explore a little more why why were the hips failing that is why because the younger patients were getting uh thas nordic registry showed me this data of actually patients younger than 21 years uh, getting hip arthroplasty done that's fairly rare in our practice i have probably have done one or two less than 21 years and their survival rate at you know a 21 year old person gets a tha and survival rate is 86% so 14% are going to get a revision at 30 years of age that's that's a lot uh, and the aseptic loosening was the main cause of revision so we need to find ways to reduce that aseptic loosening rates i thought let's go a little older patients younger than 55 years still young another systematic review published last year five year survivals at 98.7 10 year survivals at 94.6 and then that's the time the data started going wonky at 10 to 14 years 27 to 99.5 percent that is central center variation a huge variation at 15 to 19 59 to 84 percent at 20 to 24 years 70 to 77 percent and at 25 years plus 60 percent survival now younger patients are suffering quite a lot and where are these hips failing one the failure of fixation the last few talks have focused on the fixation methods and we uh, know how to improve it and should not be failing any more hopefully and secondly they are failing due to wear from the bearing surfaces wear could be for poly could be ceramic could be metals could be so what is this bearing surface which we are talking about which is wearing out you know it's basically a area of contact between two objects if the if they have a macro motion between them that is usually the primary bearing surface what we are familiar with the acetabular and the femoral uh, acetabular component the femoral head but there are secondary bearing surfaces like trunnion and the taper junction on the acetabular side also i hope the uh, martin will be telling us more about the secondary bearing surfaces i'll stick to the primary bearing surface which is the acetabulum and the femoral head and what is the wear from the uh, happening from the Yeah. bearing surface it is basically material being removed from opposing and moving surfaces which are under a applied load as well what are the various mechanisms abrasive wear adhesive wear fatigue wear third body wear i'll not go into the too many details of it but we must remember that probably adhesive wear is something which we must focus on and in the long term the fatigue wear third body wear is something which we must focus on during revisions we must not leave any loose cement pieces any uh, uh bone particles even during primary arthroplasty uh, one needs to be surgically very meticulous any small bone piece left in the joint space will lead to a catastrophic wear because of third body wear so what is this effect of wear particles mechanical i just spoke about like in third body wear the biological is that it could be direct cytotoxicity there could be immunological response immunological response is what leads to actually the aseptic loosening and the various metal ions can lead to carcinogenicity or a systemic toxicity the wear particles predominantly have been studied uh, from uh, polyethylene 
they induce various kinds of uh, response from the our immune cells they if they are less than 150 nanometer they will be pinocytos 150 nanometer 10 micron phagocytosis or more than 20 micron multi giant cell response now 150 nanometer to 10 micron is something which we would like to focus on because those are the uh, phagocytosis leading to the aseptic loosening they have complex underlying mechanisms involving various cytokines chemokines i would not go into the details of it otherwise we would have a separate lecture focused on just the chemical pathways leading to osteolysis but then we know that wear particles are the problem how to tackle them we can reduce the wear by bearing surface modification because prevention is better than cure. Or we can modify the response to wear particles, which is the immune response can be modulated. We can use rankel inhibitors, we can use bisphosphonates. There are a lot of drugs which are coming up on that, but then that's for another day. So we want to reduce the wear, so we must have an ideal bearing surface, which should have a low coefficient of friction, a small volume of wear particle generation, low tissue reaction to the wear particles, high resistance to third body wear, and enough deformation permitted in the articular surface to permit the fluid film lubrication during the stance phase. Well, fluid film lubrication is another something which engineering people really love to describe and we uh, are not really familiar with it so much, but uh, which is the ideal one, the bearing surface. Now that I've given you the description of it, human articular cartilage remains the best bearing surface available in engineering terms because uh, it has all those features which I just described, low coefficient of friction, no wear particle generation, no tissue reaction and no third body wear and enough deformation. Compared to a cartilage, most of the man-made bearing surfaces have hundreds of times of higher friction and wear rates. The options available to us are number one, the gold standard, which is polyethylene, which could be the polyethylene insert in a uh, uncemented component or a cemented acetabular cup. And on the femoral side, it is the cobalt chrome alloys, which remain the gold standard. But the new gold standard, probably Martin will tell us. Okay. Now, how to modify this? We can modify the poly or we can just replace the poly. And there are multiple options on the femoral head side as well. As long as we bow our heads to the holy grail of zero or minimal friction, a low surface wear and minimal, absolutely minimal inflammatory response to those wear particles which are generated. Chanle uh, taught us how to reduce the wear in, in the small head. And of course, he is the one who brought polyethylene into the practice of uh, orthopedics, but we must remember it is not any poly which can be used. It is an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene which can be used in the orthopedic practice and it remains the mainstay of joint replacement over the last half of a century. The results in elderly have been good, but as I highlighted earlier, it's the young patients which remain the challenge where we need to improve the poly for those young patients. But the Industry has added newer manufacturing processes in terms of in, in the terms of sterilization, new sterilization techniques, new manufacturing techniques that, that is direct compression molding, direct, uh, which is a little more expensive technique, but it has much lesser wear rates than the more popular RAM extrusion. RAM extrusion allows the industry to manufacture at a much larger scale, but at a lower cost. Obviously, they prefer RAM extrusion, but if we had a choice, I would always use a RAM com uh, uh, direct compression molded polyethylene. And there have been advances in polymer chemistry, the cross-linking, which is uh, if, what everyone is talking about. Cross-linking, first generation, second generation, third generation, and whatnot. And we'll see what it, all that cross-linking is all about after we know what the sterilization does to the poly. The sterilization, number one, if we do... Again, what the industry says, bulk sterilization by radiation, that leads to oxidation of the poly. That oxidation is obviously going to uh, reduce the mechanical properties of the poly, which is in form of decrease in molecular weight, loss of ductility, decrease in strength, and we have disastrous uh, you know, in, uh, breakages of poly, both in the knees and in the hips. So how to improve it? Well, the same industry gave us improvement in the poly in form of radiation sterilization only, but not in presence of air, but in vacuum or in presence of an inert gas. 
or the other method of gas gas sterilization which could be ethylene oxide or plasma sterilization which these gas sterilization methods do not cause oxidation of the poly which is the, basically the oxidation remains the main enemy of the poly and once you test these things for where the gamma irradiated poly in a vacuum environment and use with use of barrier packaging it remains the one which has the least wear rates and of course gamma irradiated poly in air has the maximum wear rates i will not bother you with the technical details of the cross linking process except that it's the radiation various doses of radiation which cause the cross linking and similar to studies have borne out that they have definitely decrease increase the wear resistance and decrease the wear particles the various first generation cross linking and then second generation uh, cross linking happened by addition of the annealing process which is multiple cycles of irradiation followed by sub melting point annealing this is how a longevity uh, cross link poly from zimmer is manufactured i would not bother you with the technical details of it but the final one is during this process you can add free radical scavengers vitamin e poly the yellow colored poly which is commercially available is the latest generation of poly which is now available with us this <coughs> crossing poly basically removes any uh, decreases the in vivo oxidation so while having similar wear characteristics as a crossing poly it has better fatigue resistance in the long term that is what theory says uh, we would know from the registry data in uh, probably a decade or so because this poly hasn't been there long enough the effects of cross linking as i already said it improves the adhesive and abrasive wear which is the main thing uh, uh, main wear in hip replacement but also it comes at, at a cost of decreased ductility lesser resistance to fatigue failure and makes it more brittle but with, hopefully vitamin e addition will take care of that part commercially available options there are multiple of them i'll not go uh, i've just named a few of them there are probably a dozen more available from various companies but coming to okay all these are the options but do they work well there are so many studies which have now documented that there is significant reduction of wear as well as uh, which is volumetric wear as well as the linear wear in crossling polyethylene this is just one of them there are so many of the long list of them but does this wear lead to decrease osteolysis also yes it does uh, we have 10 year follow ups we have 15 years and 20 now 20 year follow ups also close to being available in terms of which shows that osteolysis is almost almost nil at 10 years in this study but longer term studies have shown that the osteolysis is much much lesser so is it compatible with large uh, diameter heads that is where a major contentious issue is with you know orthopedic surgeons get greedy once we have the prior lesser wear we want to put a larger head because larger head is going to reduce the dislocation rates and increase the range of motion but then that comes at a cost of higher poly wear so with fatigue setting in at a longer time rim cracking and liner failure can happen with conventional poly as well as with cross link poly if thickness is less than 5 mm although there is a study which compared a 3.8 mm cross link poly with that of 5.8 mm and found no difference but most of us most investigators most surgeons would not like to use a thin stabilizer liner less than 5 mm definitely because they are going to lead to a early failure there are cases which have been reported so but in the long term we know that cross linking has led to favorable as well as unfavorable changes but the uh, so far clinical outcomes have been favorable and that brings us to the metal on metal bearing which is probably something which has been in clinical use much longer than any other bearing surface much before the poly came along mckee ferrar used it and so many others used it and it was a commonly used option till the last decade and because of its apparent advantage of great resistance to wear but it also had a huge problem called alveol lesion which we now know over the last decade this alveol lesion i will not go into details of it but national joint registry of england as well as the australian joint registry came out with their data and they found a huge risk of revision coming over at 5 years 6 years 7 years 8 years catastrophic failures so rate of metal on metal total hip replacement obviously then dropped after that 
and with the registry recommendation that these should not be implanted and obviously we know that uh, dpu and a lot of other companies are paying still paying for it even after a decade since they stopped implanting these because of the lot of litigation issues so which brings us to the ceramic on ceramic bearings well surface finish of ceramics we know that is much smoother than the metal implants they are harder than metal they are more resistant to scratching and third body wear and the linear rate of ceramic on ceramic is almost zero so they should be actually surviving forever but they do not because they do have their issues which those issues were resolved from first generation to second to third to fourth generation now for the last 20 years uh, the fourth generation uh, ceramic is what we call as delta ceramic now these improvements are fairly technical thing which uh, somebody wants to use they can ask for my presentation i can send it over happy thing but one must understand the tribology of ceramic on ceramic that the smaller grains have led to a lower surface roughness leading to reduced friction high hardness of this delta ceramic has led to low wear rates and high wettability of the same ceramic has led to fluid film lubrication lubrication in fact ceramic on ceramic is the only bearing combination which we have in which fluid film lubrication happens most of them is either boundary lubrication or uh and so again as we explored on the poly is there evidence on ceramic on ceramic is it more resistant to wear has it reduced osteolysis are there any unique complications specific to ceramics is the longevity better let's see if we can answer these questions well more resistant to wear definitely yes the there are various rcts which say that no. when we go to the histopathological analysis of the debris the reaction to wear debris of ceramic fibrocytic not macro not no giant cells hardly any macrophages so there there's not much in the periprosthetic tissue so there's hardly any septic loosening so ceramic on ceramic remains the only bearing that has long term survival without adverse reaction to wear debris but there are unique complications to the ceramics where because ceramic is brittle material it leads to those thin liners can fracture especially while being inserted because the taper junctions are still a challenge which probably martin will tell us about what is the taper, taper junction uh, challenge about the liners and old generation the first and second generation ceramic on ceramic had a fracture rate as high as 20% which led to them falling into disrepute but with the delta ceramic that has less the fracture rate has come down to less than 0.1% which is absolutely acceptable squeaking remains the noisy hits remain a problem uh, they became very popular cuts in the striker uh, striker hips but then as we learned more about the squeaky hips we realized that it was the squeaking was not because of any inherent issue for in the ceramics it was because of a malpositioned component hard on hard bearing a very high demand surgeries you all the principles which were outlined in the planning of the surgery and in the cemented and uncemented components which were uh, you know highlighted by the previous speakers in the session 1 2 and 3 they need to be followed very meticulously to have a perfect composition uh, position of the acetabular component as well as a good offset from the femoral side also to avoid any striped wear which will lead to squeaking of the hips because that changes a lot of uh, biomechanical conditions there but then clinically these have now become fairly rare because we understand it from much much better and then ceramics with their only one head size per cup diameter no lateralized liners no elevated rims you know we have all these options in the poly they decrease our chances to customize per operatively you need to have a perfect pre op plan and go and implement it there because equalizing leg lengths and adjusting the offsets vertical and horizontal will become a challenge if you are using a ceramic liner we can't use poly for it even for stability also there is no elevated liner is available so that gives you places you are at a disadvantage and then this is something which i have uh, revised for the liner chipping on insertion i've had patients coming to me where the index surgeon uh, forgot or rather ignored that the liner has been not seated completely that happens one 
there's a taper junction issue secondly there's a malposition this surgical technique prior challenge or there's a manufacturing issue also that when we are impacting the liner and the shell expands and the taper junction is not adequate to uh, cater for that expansion so when the patient starts walking there is a chipping of the liner of uh, the edge of the liner this is basically a design design related issue as i said so and there are obviously difficulties during revision of a broken ceramic whenever we are trying to revise a fractured ceramic a total synovectomy is needed and liner exchange usually is not sufficient we have to revise the cup also because the while we are removing the liner the shell or the taper junction of the shell right, may get damaged so is the longevity better well it is comparable we will have the data very soon as of now it is but the outcomes are comparable to metal on poly or ceramic on poly articulations time shall tell but right now they uh, they are going neck neck to neck with all other bearing surfaces which brings us to the ceramic on crosslink poly or ceramic on conventional poly most of us are not not using conventional poly now anymore because we know that ceramic on crosslink poly both the creep and wear rates are significantly better and this is what most of the studies are also saying but then the effect of large head size because this is what most of us try to use uh, uh, this is showing that 36 mm actually has a accelerated poly wear rate the higher rate uh, as compared to 28 and 32 mm so be careful when you are using large heads in that thin poly liner and the final option the oxidized zirconium the ceramic metal alloy Uh, which is patented by Smith and Nephew, so I will not be encouraging about it too much. But it is uh, metal that can be oxidized, which becomes zirconia on the surface. Which is you heat the outer surface, which becomes now the patented name called oxinium, the oxidized zirconium, similar to it. It has similar properties like uh, like ceramic, low wear properties. and but the advantage of the strength of the metal within its core so becomes less susceptible to the brittle fracture which ceramics were actually susceptible to so with all these options uh, which are available commercially to us let's see what do the registries say well, the dutch arthroplasty register published uh, in 2018 i got i was actually surprised i was expecting that the revision rates would be minimum for either ceramic on ceramic or ceramic on crosslink poly i was surprised to see actually the oxinium on crosslink poly has the least revision rates and of course ceramic on ceramic was one above it and as expected metal on conventional poly had the highest revision rate so this was only the dutch arthroplast which I, i said okay let me explore the australian registry australian new zealand combined registry of course which actually showed the similar trends over a longer term at 15 years again it was ceramicized metal or the oxinium on crosslink poly which had the least revision rates again now that was a surprise metal on crosslink poly and ceramic on crosslink poly uh, sorry the uh, ceramic on crosslink poly was uh, number 2 and number 3 was metal on crosslink poly so there were no surprises there except that the oxinium on crosslink poly has the least revision rate uh, lesser than even the uh, ceramic on crosslink poly so that says something so having covered all the biomaterials which are available now what are the alternatives which probably will be available to us in a few years the polymer composites which have been explored cambridge cup mitch cup they were explored in the around i think about 5 years back but their data says that they have not really worked well so not being launched commercially then various options on the metallic side or the femoral head side also are being explored surface texturing actually you we expect in engineering terms uh, we would expect that surface texturing should lead to higher wear rate higher friction rate but not it happens other way around because all those uh, dimples they help out how the dimpled femoral head uh just like surface texture poly had lesser maximum contact pressure lower volumetric wear 10% lesser wear depth has been documented and the 
dimples provide better lubrication and allow capturing of the wear particles out of the uh, fluid film leading to lesser third body wear even the special coatings which are being explored both on the establer side and the femoral head none of them has commercially launched but they are there which are expected to uh, change the lubrication to uh, fluid film uh, lubrication i hope they work out long term results are well not as yet available probably it's only animal studies which are going on various compliant bearings like polyurethane are being tried and last but not the least the institute of biomedical engineering of leeds is trying tissue scaffolds for transplant after removing their cells basically uh biomed is now uh, science fiction which we are talking of they want 50 active years after 50 well, let's let's see if they are successful i don't know and talking of the engineering aspects of bearing surfaces the kind of research which is required it requires scientific knowledge in many engineering fields and all of them coming together to collaborate they are collaborating and hopefully we will have something new very soon so that is what the future was so now seeing what is available to us what should we be using in our younger patients specifically older patients everything works well as long as they are working in young so crossling poly probably yes ceramics probably yes oxinium yes in fact going by the registry result that should be the preferred surface on the femoral head side special coatings i would wait for the results i am not one of the early adopters i am a little skeptic about my in my practice i want to wait for the registry data results peak composites polyurethane that's is science fiction let's see if they survive in the longer term coming to the future one must remember that history of orthopedics has its fair share of disastrous failures of well meant implant improvements because the, not necessarily all of them were improvements not all of them are in vivo successes so further research remains warranted before we adopt them in clinical practice and to conclude the long term survivorship requires the three tri the triad to be focused on the patient factors the surgeon factors the implant factors and this is what we are exploring in this whole, all these webinars and bearing surface options just form a small part of the implant factors hopefully we will choose wisely and depending on our patients thank you